everybody. Welcome back to our Friday night Bible study. We are studying lesson number 12 in our syllabus. We're on page 81. The title of this lesson is The Three Days and Three Nights. Uh, welcome everybody on Zoom. And we want to uh, welcome everybody that's supporting us on YouTube as well. Uh, we want to remind those of you on Zoom and YouTube uh, to please get a copy of the syllabus. You can download a PDF copy. Paul's got that in the chat for the people on Zoom and, and YouTube on the description tab. Click on that. There'll be a link to download a PDF and also a link where you can purchase a copy after the Sabbath. You're going to want one in hand. Um, it's extremely useful for correcting typos and uh, putting your own notes and, and verses and, and all that kind of stuff on there, highlighting. Uh, we recommend you get a copy of that. You can also get a hold of us on all our social media um, connection, WhatsApp. Uh, we're on Instagram, Facebook. Um, you can pretty much get a hold of us if you would like to. Um, but uh, we just want to thank you for subscribing, for sharing the videos. Keep it up. Um, our subscribership has gone up. And we're very pleased with that because it means um, that you guys are participating. You're, you're clicking buttons, sharing the gospel. So we got to do that while we can. Let's enjoy this freedom while we have it. And uh, with that, let's go ahead and bow our heads for prayer, and we'll get into our study tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for another day of life um, that you created us and that we get to contemplate, honor, and praise you for that on this Sabbath day. We thank you for everything that you provide and that we're learning more about Jesus, our Redeemer, another reason um, to enjoy the Sabbath even more as we um, embrace what you've done for us, what you're doing, and what you have planned for us. We don't want to miss out on anything. Heavenly Father, we choose you as our God. We reject Satan. And I pray for each person participating in this study, whether on Zoom or on YouTube, um, that they would be blessed, that the Holy Spirit would continue working in their lives, that they would be lights shining in their community, in their household, um, whoever they are, wherever they're at, we ask um, for a special blessing upon them. Please forgive us for our sins where we failed you and each other. And uh, help us to grow closer to you because of this study. Help us to understand Jesus more and be like him because of this study. That our experience with you would be more real and uh, deeper because of this study. And our experience and our relationship with the people that we're surrounded by also grow um, because of the life, eternal life that is in your words that we're going to study. We need the Holy Spirit, Heavenly Father. Please guide us as we open your word that we would understand uh, these deep mysteries, and that they would um, be truths that we come to love. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we're on page 81, and we're going to start where it says the time expressions relating to the passion of Jesus. The Gospels use four expressions to describe the duration of Christ's passion. This is very important to understand and to know um, because there's times when the Gospels seem like they conflict, maybe they contradict each other. Um, we, we're blessed to have the perspective of um, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we know, um, you know they're recording things that they saw personally and also um, things that others saw. So um, it's nice that we get different perspectives of the same event. So we always want to look for the harmony when things seem to contrast uh, that's where we need to, uh, what we would say in, in business, right? Sharpen our pencils. Um, you know, we need to dig a little bit deeper, be more diligent. But let's notice these expressions here. And we'll start with John chapter 2, verses 19 through 21. And it's in regards to the three days. Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple. And you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. So in John, you see the expression in three days. So the next expression we're going to look at is after three days. And we read here in Mark chapter 8, verse 31. It says, and he began to teach them that the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and must be killed. And after three days, rise again. Now, we so we've seen in three days, after three days. Uh, notice what Matthew writes in here. And even Paul um, writes in, in 1 Corinthians. 
when he said uses the expression on the third day. So Matthew 16, 21, notice it says, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised on the third day. And then 1 Corinthians 15, 4, Paul writes, for I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. The final expression we're going to look at here is three days and three nights. So in Matthew 12, verse 39 and 40, uh, we find it says, But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, let so us... Let's Go ahead. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Let us analyze the first three expressions. If taken literally, these three expressions cannot be reconciled one with another. So we have in three days, which would mean within the limits of the three days. After three days would mean sometime after three days. And on the third day would mean at any time during the third day. Now, maybe at first, Paul, people don't really see the significance of understanding this mm. until you run into somebody who has a skewed perception, uh, misconception, or misunderstanding of Scripture when they're holding uh, in specifically to the text that you read um, that something had to have taken place in a literal 72-hour period, which really dismisses what the other Gospels say, and that's what we're going to study here, right? So we're going to let the Scriptures um, interpret themselves here. Now, there's this um expression called inclusive reckoning it's how we can understand um how the ancients reckon years and days the answer is that they use this method inclusive reckoning that any portion of a day or night is reckoned as a complete day or night so let's let's look at some examples first here genesis 7 uh, 6 and, and verses 6 and 11 noah was 600 years when the flood came but the flood came in the 600 year of his life. Uh, the next uh, example here is a child was circumcised when he was eight days old, but it actually happened the eighth day. Uh, and we see that in Leviticus 12, three, or even after eight days were accomplished. And we see that in Luke two twenty one. So let's look at Exodus 19 verses 10 and 11. The third day is equivalent to the day after tomorrow. And, and by the way, as we go through this, we're going to realize that this is how we still talk to this day, you right. know, and we'll, we'll discuss that a little bit more, but Exodus 19, 10, 11. Uh, then the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai and the sight of all the people. So it's not talking about a 72 hour period but it means today, tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow. Jesus clearly indicated that he was using inclusive reckoning in Luke 13, 32, and 33. Here, Jesus equated the third day with what we refer to as the day after tomorrow. So it says here in Luke, And he said to them, Go tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. Nevertheless, I must journey today, tomorrow, and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish outside of Jerusalem. Makes pretty good sense there to me. Yeah, and it's nice that we have all these biblical examples. You know, it it you know, um, when we're discussing a topic or a verse that may seem contrary to many other verses, you know, a way I've uh, was taught a long time ago, you know, is imagine a scale, you know, and you put, you know, a, a weight, you know, on, on uh, one side of the scale. Um, and, you know, this would represent one verse, but you have all these other verses, you know, um, that tip the scale in this direction, you know, wh which verses do you think are the correct verses, you know, versus, and it's not that this verse is incorrect, 
but our understanding of it, you know, um, clearly isn't clear. Let's continue on. Uh, late in the afternoon on Resurrection Day, one of the disciple, one of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus said, "Today is the third day since these things were done." Notably, on Sunday afternoon, it was still the third day, and Jesus had resurrected many hours before. If Jesus had res resurrected immediately at the end of the 72 hours, the disciples would have had to have said it was the fourth day. So this is Luke 24, uh, verses 13 and 21, I believe. Yep. It says, Now, behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, beside all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Again, uh, very clear uh, in regards to that. Right. So let's continue looking here at this expression, the three days and three nights. However, how do we explain the expression three days and three nights? That's the question. Well, let's read the key verse in Matthew 12, 39 and 40 uh, again and determine whether this expression means exactly 72 hours, not one minute or one minute less. And it says, but he answered and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So we see that as so comparison, and you get that other places in the Bible, as it was in the days of Noah, so right. will it be in the days uh, or in the coming of the Son of Man, as right. it was in the days of Lot. So, you know, so we see that same yeah. gra uh, grammatical expression used. Right. And and again, that's and that's a good point to bring up. Uh, when we look at comparisons, is it exactly right. the same, you know, in, in the aspect of the way the earth was, you know, the way human beings were then, you know, it's like, no, it's like the, the world, you know, the atmosphere of, of evil and sin, you know, was, uh, was all over the place. So before Jesus comes, uh, the wickedness of men would be great, would be constant, um, would occupy all the thoughts of their mind, you know, so it's, um, it's just like, but it's still a different, you know, time, you know right. what I mean? It's a, a different period. Right. Let's, let's look at this next um, portion on, uh, on page 83. So there's four options. Jesus, A, either Jesus never said it. Jesus believed it, but he was wrong. The three days and three nights must begin at a different time than has been traditionally believed. Or the expression three days and three nights does not mean exactly 72 hours. Some have insisted the expression three days and three nights means just that, exactly 72 hours, not one minute more or one minute less. They argue that the time interval between a Friday crucifixion and a Sunday resurrection would not even be close to 72 hours. Those who believe Jesus was crucified on Friday and resurrected on Sunday only have parts of three days, you know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and only two nights. Friday and Saturday night, the Sabbath. For this reason, they affirm that we must look for another day as the beginning point of the 72 hours. The deceased worldwide church of God, among others, has taught that the crucifixion took place on Wednesday afternoon and the resurrection on Sabbath afternoon, exactly 72 hours later. And uh, we'll try to put in the link maybe a copy of that book Paul, you know, that we've been studying um, that was written just about this topic here. Uh, re recently, a prominent Seventh-day Adventist physician has suggested that the 72 hours began on a Tuesday evening when Judas contacted the Jewish leaders and laid plans to betray Jesus and end on Friday at, uh, at sundown with the resurrection. Those who believe in this way, maybe they're very sincere and have a seemingly good motivation they argue that a Sabbath resurrection would eliminate the need to observe Sunday in honor of the resurrection. But however, good intentions can never take place of sound biblical study. Mm. So our heart may be in the right place, but if you're doing the wrong thing, you're doing the wrong thing, right? Yep. I believe those who, are in, who argue in this fashion begin with the false premise that the expression three days and three nights must mean exactly 72 hours. So the question is, Paul, what does this expression mean? Well, let's look at an example here. 
So when we take a cruise that lasts four days and three nights, are we on the ship for exactly 84 hours, not one minute more, not one less? Well, of course not. The day of departure and the day of return are calculated as full days. Mm -hmm. However, we must still resolve a problem. Even if we use inclusive reckoning, we only have parts of three days and only two full nights. Well, how do we resolve this problem? You know, and I think too, like when you get a hotel, same thing, you get a hotel for three days, two nights, you check in on day one and you check out on day three, you're not there for a full, you know, three days, but it's still calculated as three days, right. two nights, right? Right. So how do we solve this problem? Well, it's really pretty simple. It must be underlined that Jesus did not say that he would be in the grave for three days and three nights. And neither did he say that he would be dead for three night, three days and three nights. Jesus would have been wrong if he had stated this. Obviously, Jesus did not mean that he was going to be in the grave for three days and three nights, or else he would have used the word grave instead of the enigmatic expression in the heart of the earth. Now, Jesus knew the word grave uh, we see in John 5, 28. And yet he did not say that he would go to the grave for three days and three nights. Again, he used the symbolic expression in the heart of the earth. Right. Now, it is important to underline that the body of Jesus rested in a tomb hewn in rock that was above the earth. He did not literally go to the heart of the earth. Mm -hmm. So we must understand this expression as symbolic language. So we are left with the question. What is meant by the expression in the heart of the earth? Right. It's kind of like can't have it both ways type thing, you know? It's like, well, I'm going right. to take the three days and three nights literal, but all the rest of it isn't literal. That doesn't make sense, right? That's a that's right. a confusing method of Bible study. This text clearly makes a parallel between the belly of the fish and the heart of the earth. This is biblical typology. That is to say, if we want to understand what the expression the heart of the earth means, then we must first comprehend the experience of Jonah in the belly of the fish. Look, when Jesus gives a reference to something in the Bible, like you talked about earlier with Noah and Lot, he's saying, study that. He says that with Daniel, you know, in Matthew 24, they're talking about the abomination of desolation spoken about the prophet Daniel. You, you've got to go. That's, that's got to, um, take your mind, you know, to, I need to understand that better because he wants me to understand what he's saying. So he's giving me a comparison of something here. Right. A careful examination of the poem of Jonah 2 reveals that the strongest emphasis in Jonah's experience was not his death, but rather the agony caused by his alienation from God while he was still alive in the belly of the fish. Jonah was actually conscious at least during part of this period, because he uttered a prayer to God, which requires consciousness. Therefore, the prayer that he uttered while he was still alive must be included within the period of the three days and three nights. There's a lot of death language in Jonah chapter 2 when he prayed from the belly of the fish. So let's look at some of those expression here, those expressions here. Um, the prayer of Jonah in Jonah 2. The psalm in Jonah 2 uses a series of symbolic expressions to describe the place where Jonah went during his ordeal. Notice this. It says, the belly of Sheol, the deep. Those are two different words. Shut in by the bars of the earth, the heart of the seas, and the moorings, the roots of the mountains. So let's examine, examine this psalm verse by verse. There's, I think there's only 10 verses, so it's not... Not too long here. Verse 1 says, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God. So this means he was still alive and conscious. And uh, in the heart of the earth must, it must also mean that Jesus was alive and, and conscious, right? So when we see as Jonah, right? So, so the Son of Man. So we're as Jonah. This is the way Jesus is too, okay? So he prayed to the Lord, his God, from the fish's belly. And then in verse 2 we see... And he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction. Uh, in NIV, it uses the word distress. And he answered me, out of the belly of Sheol, NIV says the depths of the grave, 
I cried and you heard my voice. Let's notice verse three. So he says, for you cast me in the deep into the heart of the seas, which is parallel to the heart of the earth, and the floods, representing his enemies, surrounded me. All your billows and your waves passed over me. Now let's notice here in Psalm 69, uh, 1 through 3, 9, 14 through 18, and verse 21, we're going to see this messianic prophecy clearly describes Jesus crying out like Jonah did. Mm -hmm. Jesus describes himself as surrounded by waters, and he uses the specific Hebrew word deep as he prays to his father. It is obvious that literal waters did not surround Jesus. He was referring to his enemies. So that symbolic right. expression, right? Uh, so it says here in Psalm, save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I have come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. I am weary with my crying. My throat is dry, like Jesus on the cross. Mm -hmm. My eyes fail while I wait for my God, because zeal for your house has eaten me up. Verse 14, deliver me out of the mire and let me not sink. Let me be delivered from those who hate me and out of the deep waters. Let not the flood water overflow me, nor let the deep, and that word is mezzola, swallow me up. And let not the pit shut its mouth on me. Hear me, O Lord, for your loving kindness is good. Turn to me according to the multitude of your tender mercies, and do not hide your face from your servant, for I am in trouble. Hear me speedily. And uh, verse 18, draw near to my soul and redeem it. Deliver me because of my enemies. And finally, verse 21, they also gave me gall for my food, and for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. So we see that prophecy, that pointing forward to Christ. And I, and I love this, that you, that you have, we've got understanding of what Christ's agony is like from multiple books in the Bible, you know, so it's not just, and it's important that we have, that's why we have so many um, books in the Bible and different authors, you know, because they're always pointing to the same thing and what they're going through, um, what they're facing, you know, as individuals um, in whatever time it is, they're facing it. Um, we have in Scripture, recorded in Scripture, because it's pointing to what Jesus um, would go through as well. Let's continue on verse 4. Jonah felt a mixture of despair and hope as much, uh, much as Jesus did in Gethsemane and on the cross. Notice this. He said, then I said, I have been cast out. And NIV says banished. Cast out of your sight, despair. Yet I will look again toward your holy temple. There's the hope, right? So cast out, banished from your sight, despair. But I'll look again toward your holy temple. There's there's the hope. So we see the mixture there. So continuing on again, this is Jonah chapter 2, verse 5. The waters surrounded me, again, talking about the wicked, even to my soul, the deep, uh, and that word is tehom, closed around me, and weeds were wrapped around my head. Man, when we went over this study, uh, I think five or six years ago, one of the times we went through this, um, one of the people in the class brought up a point on this is the weeds wrapped around my head. Is that alluding to the crown of thorns, you know, on Jesus head? And I was like, man, I never thought about that, but everything's pointing to his suffering, you know, what Jesus right. would go through. So um, I thought that was kind of neat. Uh, notice what Psalm 22, one and two say, uh, Jesus felt forsaken of his father, but at the same time manifested hope. So you're going to see that kind of that despair and hope it says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? And from the words of my groaning, oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. And in the night season, I am not silent. So let's continue in verse six of Jonah two. Uh, it is obvious that this is highly symbolic language. And we've been seeing that in all these verses. Uh, it says, I went down to the moorings of the mountain. Uh, in the NIV, it says the roots of the mountains. Um, and again, this is not literally. Right. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever. In 1 Samuel 23, 7, uh, it was he was shut in and could not escape. Yet you have brought 
up my life from the pit. Uh, King James uses the word corruption, and it's the same word we see in Psalm 1610, as well as Job 1714, Psalm 30, verse 9, and Ezekiel 28, verse 8. Uh, and the verse finished, uh, O Lord, my God. Yeah, First Samuel, uh, going to that text, 23, 7, says, And Saul was told that David had gone to Kela. Therefore Saul said, God has delivered him into my hand, for he has shut himself in by entering a town that has gates and bars. Mm -hmm. You got Psalm 16, 10. Oh, yep. Uh, so it says Psalm 1610, for you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. All right. So, so the point of these texts is we're seeing the different expressions talking about the same thing. Okay. Psalm 30 verse nine, what profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? Translated corruption. Will the dust praise you? Will it declare your truth? And then we'll notice in Job 17, 13 through 16, if I wait for the grave as my house, if I make my bed in the darkness, if I say to corruption or the pit, you are my father and to the worm, you are my mother and my sister, where then is my hope? As for my hope, who can see it? Will they go down to the gates of Sheol? Shall we have rest together in the dust? Yeah. Notice what Ezekiel writes in chapter 28, verse 8. They shall throw you down into the pit, and you shall die the death of the slain in the midst of the seas. Going back to Jonah, uh, chapter 2, verse 7 says, When my soul fainted within me, uh, or my life was ebbing away, as it says in the NIV, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. Yeah. And in verse 8, those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. And verse 9, but I will sacrifice, Jesus was sacrificed for our sins, mm -hmm. so I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Jesus had vowed that he would pay for the salvation of man. Mm -hmm. Salvation is of the Lord. Amen. And then verse 10, the three days and three nights ended when the fish spewed out Jonah says, so the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land, just as God spoke to Jesus, and the grave spewed him out. Isn't that beautiful? I think we have a better understanding when Jesus makes a reference to something in, in a comparison, so we can have a better understanding of what he's going through, the agony he's going through, and we just had that um, with, with uh, Jonah, and uh, specifically chapter 2 there. Now, the parallel with Jesus the language of this psalm seems to suggest that after Jonah prayed his prayer, he died in the belly of the fish, and on the third day he was spewed out. Well, in a similar way, Jesus prayed to his father in Gethsemane and on the cross, and then died and was spewed out of the grave the third day. This parallel is not based on idle speculation, but rather on the death terminology in the psalm as well um, as on the parallel in Luke 11. 29 through 32. Uh, let's read Luke 11, 29 uh, and verse 30 here. Uh, it says, And while the crowds were thickly gathered together, he began to say, This is an evil generation. It seeks a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. Verse 30, For as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so also the son of man will be to this generation. So here we see that Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites and that Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian empire and their patron God was a fish. The Assyrian inscriptions in the British museum are replete with fish. So we see that symbolism there again. Yeah. Not, not a happenstance, right? Right. Um, so question, how did Jonah become a sign to the Ninevites? Well, the sign had something to do with him being in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, and then the people accepting his message as a result of seeing the sign. Jonah cried out in anguish, died, resurrected on the third day, and as a result, the people were persuaded when he preached. 
So in a similar way, Jesus also cried out to his father, died, was buried, and resurrected the third day. But in contrast to the Ninevites, the people did not believe in him. And the reason why so many misunderstand the meaning of the three days and the three nights is because they all get caught up in the time period instead of going to the Old Testament background to analyze Jonah's experience during that time period, hence the reference to Jonah. Neither Jonah nor Jesus went literally to the heart of the earth. Neither did they literally go to the roots of the mountains. The heart of the earth would refer to the darkest, loneliest, and furthest place in the universe from the Father. The heart of the earth would refer to the place where the forces of darkness, both human and demonic, shut him in. So bringing this back to the sanctuary, the priest placed the sins on the head of the lamb while it was alive. Now, why on the head? Because Jesus suffered his deepest mental agony and anguish in Gethsemane and on the cross while he was still alive. Let's notice Matthew chapter 26, uh, verses 38 through 47. It says, then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Again, a second time, he went away and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. So he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and elders of the people. Yeah, notice uh, Luke twenty-two forty-four. 44, um, continuing on with uh, what he's going through. It says, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Let's notice in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7, verse 7, Jesus cried out in agony to his father. It says, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. Yeah, and then the next text there is still the same text, right? It was it was heard because of his godly fear, Hebrews 5, 7. And then going on, Matthew 27, 46, as of for a moment, Jesus feels forsaken by his father when he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In Luke 23, 46, however, in the next moment, he commands his spirit into the father's hands. It says in Luke, Father, into your hands, I command my spirit. And elsewhere in the New Testament, we're told that Jesus went to Hades and, and did not see corruption, Acts 2.31, and to the Abusos, uh, Romans 10.7. And in the Ephesians 4.9, we're told that Jesus descended to the lower parts of the earth. These are different expressions, right? And what, is, what does that mean? You know, it's that, that agony and that separation from the Father. Now, this is literally not true because Jesus was buried in a tomb that was hewn in rock above the ground. He didn't literally go to Hades or the abyss or to the lower parts of the earth. Literal waters did not attempt to drown him. These are figurative expressions. Luke twenty two fifty three 53 states that when Jesus was about to be, be, be betrayed, it was the hour of the powers of darkness. Now, when we continue on with our study, uh, we want to be able to devote an entire study to finishing out this this chapter, but we're really going to focus on um, the agony and the anguish that Jesus went through from the from a mental standpoint. You know, um, Hollywood likes to kind of gl yeah glorify, you know, put emphasis, and a lot of people do too, and they have a misunderstanding, I think, of uh, of Christ's suffering, but they put a lot of focus on the physical aspect of it. And we're going to show in our next study um, how it was the mental side of it that was uh, more painful than what he went through um, physically. And you may think that that's, that's absurd, but join us in our next study because we're going to go through that 
um, again, through the Gospels, and uh, we'll go through some amazing quotations um, as well. But it's good for us, Paul, to study this. You know, we're encouraged um, to, to contemplate Christ an hour a day, um, especially uh, what he did for us on the cross. You know, um, one of my favorite quotes in the Spirit of Prophecy, you know, says that we will, um, the science of the cross will be studied throughout all eternity. So you're never, we're never going to fully understand it, but we'll always be un, like growing in our understanding of what Christ went through, because this is a love story. Right. You know, this isn't, we're not to focus, you know, on, on the physical pain and the blood, you know, what, what we're, what we need to focus on is what love does God have for us that he sent his only son um, to die the death, to live, show us how to live the life we're supposed to live. He didn't live that life. So we don't have to. He showed us how to live the life, but he did die the death. Um, so we, we don't have to, you know, the wages right. of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Um, you know, oftentimes you think that's just mortal death. Well, there are a lot of saved people, a lot of righteous people who have died, you know, so it's not talking about mortal death. It's talking about that separation from the father. And Jesus experienced that. And we have a better understanding of what he experienced because of what Jonah went through and um, what's written in the Psalm with David, you know, so, and, and maybe we've gone through some mental anguish, you know? Um, so the lesson as we see, you know, we're studying three days and three nights, but we we really want to see what, um, what Jesus went through and how he was able to go through with it because we're going to, look, man, we're going to be facing some tough experiences in our life. And in the world we live in today, it's only going to get crazier and crazier. Um, all we're going to have is, is to be able to depend on the word of God, you know, so though Jesus, um, you know, the things that he felt, what Jonah felt, you know, we're going to experience. And maybe some people watching this have experienced that, you know, that they feel like God's forsaken and that he's left them, you know, so we can learn a lot from this, not just what does the three days and three nights mean, but really the emphasis on the agony, the mental anguish that Jesus um, experienced beginning in Gethsemane, which would have been Thursday night, we're going to talk about that in a study um, that we're preparing. We're going to have one uh, that goes over Passion Week. Um, so we're going to talk about day by day um, what took place up to Jesus dying on the cross, being uh, resting in the tomb on the Sabbath, and then resurrecting um, the next day. So we'll, we'll keep studying it. But there's a lot more to this, Paul, than just was it 72 hours or not? You know, Because what is Jesus really wanting us to understand? Um, but how awful sin is you know, how awful Satan is and the powers of darkness. But the hope in that, you know, is how wonderful God is, you know, and you're not giving any part of the story away by saying Jesus resurrects from the dead, you know, so the hope that is there, remember, he's the firstborn, you know, of those who uh, um, have died, right? It's because of his resurrection that all resurrection is, um, is possible, you know, so there's great hope in it. But We'll study next week. There's there's a very um, fo the there's a focal point on the anguish that Jesus suffers uh, mentally, and you know we're going to see that. But under we got to learn from it so we can um, apply what Jesus did. He trusted in his Father, Paul. He said, "Not not uh, you know let this cup pass from me. Not my will, not my but will. your will." You know, and he says that three times. This is Jesus talking about it, right? So what was he doing? He was relying on what you know, the promises his father had made, the pact that they had made, you know, um, but we're going to have that. We can't, we can't rely on our senses because it's going to tell us everything. It's going to just say it's darkness and God's abandoned you. And that is not what the Bible teaches us. Well, and we get the experience of them to imitate, you know, what Jonah went through when he was in the deepest, darkest part of his experience. He cries out to God right. when Jesus was in the deepest, darkest part of his experience. He cries out to God. He prays, you know, so when we are experiencing our deepest, darkest moments, what should we be doing? There you go. Yeah. Crying out to God, you know. That's right. That's right. And you see that throughout all of scripture. You know, you, you see it when they're in their deepest, darkest moments. They cry out to God. You know, most people are that way. You people who don't believe in God. When right. they're in a deep, dark experience, of maybe death seems like it's near or whatever they're going through, there's this. Where does that desire to, I'm going to pray to God, where does that come from? You know, in Genesis 3, 
315, um, God puts enmity between the serpent and the woman, you know, and uh, his seed and her seed. But that enmity is, you know, our, our nature, our carnal nature wants to sin, you know. So where does that desire come from to not want to, you know, to want to seek help externally? That comes from God. That is an amazing thing that mm -hmm. most people, I can't say everybody, I don't know, but I would say most people experience in their life. Lord, if you get me through this, then you kind of fill in the blank, you know. Right. Most people don't, they don't uh, hold up their end of the bargain, do they? You know, but God, God does, you know, so it's, uh, we can learn a lot from this, but yeah, we're, especially Paul, you're right. When we're in the deepest, darkest moments of our life, man, we need to call out to God. And when you feel like he's not there, that doesn't mean he's not there. We've got, look at Job, same thing, you know, and we could, I, I imagine every book, you know, in the Bible, we could find the example, you know, of somebody going through, yeah, that dark, dark experience, but that's exactly when we need to do it especially when you don't feel it know that just because i don't feel it doesn't mean that's true in fact my feelings are almost always wrong <laughs> let me trust in um in his word only so so we'll wrap that up for this one but next week we'll dig deeper into this paul um get a better understanding about that and um so we'll put a mark in our syllabus and, and pick that up next week so let's go ahead and, and close the prayer sounds good let's pray Father God in heaven, we thank you so much again for another day of life. Uh, we thank you for the many blessings uh, you continue to provide. And we thank you for the examples uh, that you give us, Lord. Um, we, we should always be calling out to you, not only in our deepest, deepest right. darkest moments, but also in the, the good times, Lord. We should be praising you always. Um, mm -hmm. So we just thank you for what you have done for us. Um, and for what you will continue to do for us, Lord. Um, we know that you love us, you will keep us, um, and uh, we just pray that your spirit would be with us always, dwell in our hearts and minds, creating us uh, a new spirit, Lord, uh, that we would desire you always. Um, we just uh, thank you for this day. Be with us as we uh, uh, come together um, and as we uh, go about our upcoming week. We just uh, thank you and praise you uh, in all things. Uh, we pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, if you're having a deep, dark experience and need people to pray for you, you can post it in our chat. You can email us um, if you want us to pray for you by name. Um, or maybe uh, you don't want to share your name. That's all right. But you want us to, to pray for you. And the scripture says, draw near um, to Jesus and he will draw near to you. So um, God bless you. Have a happy Sabbath. And we'll see you next week.